I'm going to go ahead and uh, make some introductions. Uh, we are joined here on our PUSD team. We have our superintendent, David Haglin, is with us. Our assistant superintendent of HR, Julio Hernandez. And we have um, Patrick Gannon, our you're gonna have to always help me, Patrick, with your title. I, I just call you our communication guru. <laughs> that works. <laughs> that and, works. Uh, the assistant to, to the business services team, Rochelle Mercado. So that is our PUSD team. I'm gonna go ahead and share uh, the uh, deck and then I'm gonna make introductions to our consultants. Okay. So my name is Ahmad Shigoslami. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Business Services. Uh, I'll be leading this effort with the support uh, of David Katz. He's our uh, demographer with Davis Demographics. And we also have William Tunick with Dennis Wilbur and Kelly um, also with us as well. So I'm gonna kind of uh, go through the um, basic uh, outline for, for uh, this evening. So we're gonna do a little bit of background information as to how we got here as we talk about uh, the um, uh, process for moving the district's election from an, a, a district at large election to um, a trustee by area. So we're gonna kind of do a little bit of background. We'll do a deep dive on the uh, transition process and our extensive community outreach, which has already started with several board meetings prior to this, but we're going to, um, uh, this is the official kickoff of that community outreach meetings that will continue uh, for the next several months. And then um, we'll have our demographer go through the mapping and criteria process and some uh, share with you some of the latest census data uh, that we have. And then um, we'll uh, kind of uh, go through the opportunities for the community input and engagement in through, throughout the process. And at the end, we'll be happy to answer um, any questions that, um, that you have. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to you, William, if you could, uh, Mr. Tunick, uh, take on the next uh, several slides. Happy to do that. Uh, good evening, everyone. William Tunick with uh, Dennis Oliver Kelly. And uh, as CBO said, we've been working with the district um, throughout this process and, and wanted to just kind of start, as was mentioned, kind of how, how did we get here? What's the background and talk a little bit about that process, what the transition process is going to look like over the next few months as the board engages with the public uh, to make this transition. And then I'll turn it over and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about, as you mentioned, the demographics and the schedule. So by way of background, and, and some of you may already be familiar with this, but just to make sure everyone has the same information, what's kind of underlying some of this is the, the California Voting Rights Act. It's, it's also known as the CVRA. This is a law that's been uh, in place actually for almost 20 years now. It affects all local agencies in the state, cities, counties, school districts, special districts. And essentially what it says is that in most cases, the use of what we call at-large elections, and I'll talk about what that is in a minute, but that's what the district uses to elect its board members, that those elections may be problematic and may actually be prohibited by California state law. And it's written in such a way that the CBRA, it's not, there's some laws that have deadlines or other types of triggers that, that sort of tell districts or local agencies when they have to make a change. The CVRA is written in such a way that it's really enforced um, through litigation and potentially attorney's fees and liabilities for local agencies. And what this has um, meant, the way that it's written is in the 20 years that we've had the CVRA, we have not had a single local agency successfully uh, defend a challenge. So in other words, if, a, if an agency has been threatened with litigation or is actually engaged in litigation, uh, to try to keep their election system under the CVRA, all of those local agencies have lost those cases and they've ended up paying a lot of attorney's fees. And what we've seen this lead to is a lot of agencies, you know, some have waited and have paid the fees. Others have decided, you know what, proactively, this is something that we think we should make this change. It may be a good policy and it also helps us avoid any concerns under the CVRA. And so we've seen uh, some school districts do that. And that's actually what the board in this case has decided to do. They held meetings in August and September where we talked about what the CVRA is. We went into more depth about some of the details and we had some discussion with the board 
uh, about the pros and the cons, what the law says, what the process looks like, and where that ultimately led the board after we had some back and forth and some good discussion uh, and public input was ultimately on October 14th, the board adopted a resolution that indicated their intent to make the transition from the current election system, the at-large elections I mentioned, to something we call by trustee area elections. I'll talk about in a minute what that means. So that intent resolution that was adopted uh, on October 14th is sort of the first formal step in this process that's going to stretch over really about the next four or five months uh, to, to make the transition from using these at-large elections to trustee area elections, which will take effect starting with the next board elections in 2022. And so with that kickoff in October, like I mentioned, that starts this community engagement and public process where we're gonna go, where the, we'll be working with the board and the public to determine um, ultimately how the maps uh, and how the trustee areas will be drawn for the district uh, and used in the elections. So if we go to the next slide, I, I know I mentioned, I, I've used the terms at large and trustee area elections. So I wanna talk a little bit about what those are, why they make a difference, kind of the policy behind the CVRA and also what the difference will be for district voters um, when, this, when this transition is made. So in this illustration here, we have the same district in both the left and the right side. So we have a district, each of the individuals represents one voter, a thousand, it, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, we have 15 of those individuals. You'll see seven are in uh, blue boxes. I think eight are in, in red. And the idea there is that those represent different voting preferences, right? So all the voters in the blue boxes uh, have one preference for candidates. Voters in, in red have another. In the uh, illustration on the left, if we have at-large elections and what at-large elections are, are, thank you, are elections where everybody in the district, all the voters anyway, vote for all five board members. So what you have right now, right? Voters, when you go to the polls, one cycle, every two years, right? You'll see three seats up for election, you'll get three votes. The next cycle, you'll see two seats up for election, you get two votes, and it goes like that every two years. So everyone in the district is voting for all five members. In that, in that system, if you have this eight, seven split, well, the district may be, or the voters may be pretty narrowly split between the two groups of, of voters, what you'll see in those elections, right, is that every election will have the same result. There'll be eight to seven will be each election, meaning that the candidates preferred by the majority, even though it's a slim majority, are going to uh, succeed and be elected in all five races. So the, the board will end up reflecting 100% the preference of the majority, even though numerically it's a pretty close split between the majority and the minority uh, voters in that situation. If you take those same voters, same district, same preferences, and we go to the right, and we have trustee area elections, and what that means is we've taken the district, uh, we've drawn sort of geographical subdivisions of the district, and this is very similar to what the state legislature used, what is, what's used for congressional um, house districts. We have five areas, because there's five board members, A, B, C, D, and E. And the elections are run in each of those trustee areas. So in other words, what district voters will see, instead of seeing two, vote, um, two seats open or three seats open every two years, every four years, you'll see one seat elect, uh, up for election. And that will be the, the to elect the board member from the trustee area in which the voter lives. So maybe vote, um, trustee areas A, B, and C will be on one cycle. So voters in those areas would see their one seat up in those four years and then the other cycle, voters in D and E will vote for their one board member from their area and only the voters in that area elect that board member. So if we take that system, which we call by trustee area elections, you'll hear cities talk about district elections, it's the same thing, it's just confusing to call it district elections for school districts. But if you use that system, here with the preferences we have, it'll actually change the outcome of the elections. What will happen is you'll end up with Three, board, three seats that'll reflect the preference of the numerical majority in this situation, but two seats are now gonna represent the preference of the numerical minority. And so that's in a nutshell, and, and there's a lot more detail about it we're not gonna go in tonight, but, but that's the difference on, or the importance of how the election system can actually impact uh, which group's preference of candidates may be elected when you go from at-large to trustee area election. So what you can tell from this example as well is, really the, the substance of the transition process 
is drawing the line. So you see those trustee area lines on the right there. The substance of the process is deciding where those lines are going to be drawn. And so if we go to the next slide, that's really what this transition process is all about. To kind of make it simpler, we split it into sort of, we, we talk about three phases. There's what we call the pre-map phase. And we'll kind of go through what that looks like, but that's a lot of gathering information, sort of getting thing, everything in place to start drawing maps. Then we have the second phase, which is the map development and leading to adoption of the maps where most of the work gets done. And the third phase is implementation. And I, I have that as a separate phase just to talk a little bit about how, what, how that affects board elections, what voters are gonna see differently uh, when this process is complete. So let's go to the next slide and we'll start talking a little bit about with the pre-map, this was my mentioned phase one. So a couple of things that are gonna happen here and, and these are some things that have already begun happening with the district. The first, as I mentioned, is that intent resolution. And what the resolution essentially says is the board has decided to make this transition it provides a rough outline for timeline for when that's going to occur and some steps uh, and details about what the board thought was important or thinks is important as we go through this process, specifically regarding uh, community input and participation in the process. The second piece of this is to retain a demographer, which we have uh, David here from Davis Demographics. The demographer is going to be the one who has the, the data that we need to draw the maps and the tools to be able to do it and the expertise to, to work with the board and to speak with the public about kind of some of the different options and how that all works. So you'll, you'll be hearing from him shortly about all of that. The other things that are gonna happen in this process are two what we call pre-map public hearings. And this is actually a legal requirement that before the board can start looking at any you know, draft maps or options as far as boundaries, the board has to hold two public hearings where we basically talk about ways that the maps might be drawn or gather input from the board and the public about certain criteria that are important before we actually start drawing maps. So you'll see on the schedule in a couple of slides, those are gonna start, uh, I think actually next week. So those will happen in November and December and that will satisfy that requirement. The other thing that's gonna happen during those public hearings, other than more information being provided to the public about the process is also the board uh, adopting mapping criteria. And again, that's something David's gonna talk a little bit about. There's, there's a set of legal criteria that we have to use when drawing maps, but then there's also other things about the community that you know, we, we can't see, and by we, I mean David and I working with the district, we can't see from looking at a map, but board members and members of the community who live in the district know if there's certain parts of the district that go together or certain types of communities of interest that we wanna make sure are maintained or how they're sort of maybe even divided between trustee areas. So that's something else you're gonna see happen in this first pre-map phase. So that'll take us, that'll get us to the point where we've had our pre-map hearings, we've got criteria for maps, we've started to gather some public input and that takes us to the next slide in, map, in phase two, which is the actual development of the maps. And there's, there's two things here I wanna talk about. There's what's required and then there's also what the additional efforts that the district's gonna be making to get community input and participation in this process. What the law says is you have to have essentially three public hearings at, during board meetings where the board will be presented with draft, public, uh, draft maps, maybe two or three different scenarios of, you know, this is, these are the ways that the lines could be drawn. Public input would be accepted. The board would pro provide direction to the demographer we like this map, we don't like that map. Can you take these two and you know, combine them to come up with a new option? And we'd go through that cycle essentially three times and the third time uh, the board would say, you know, we like map A, we like map B, that's the one we, we wanna adopt. So that's sort of the, the real basic version of the process. The board has, has, has directed that we go a little bit further, the district go further, which is to also hold uh, community workshops and information sessions not only like this, but also a little bit more interactive to get more public input uh, and community input on the actual draft maps in the trustee area. So that's something, and in a couple of slides, you'll see how that's gonna lay out schedule-wise. And actually there's already that information has been posted. I know it's on the, the district website as well, if you're looking for it. Um, but I think we're gonna have a real robust uh, opportunity for the public to provide input um, and suggestions on these maps so that the board can ultimately um, make that decision and adopt the map at the end of this phase. 
So with that process, and again, that's going to be the bulk of the process, and, and David will talk more about how the maps are going to be uh, developed. But once we have that, we have adoption by the board, then we'll move to phase three on the next slide, which is implementation. So there's, there's, a, there's pretty much one more step that we're going to see, maybe two, after the board act. So the board will adopt the map. Then there's, an, or, there's a body called the County Committee on School District Organization. There's one in every county. And what that committee will do is they will be, the, the maps adopted by the board are essentially a proposal to this county committee. They'll be asked to approve it and also to approve um, a waiver of any election requirement. The, the education code, uh, the law that applies in this situation says that when you make this type of change, there needs to be an election uh, in the district, whether or not to approve it or deny it. Um, that being said, of the 300 or so school districts that have gone through this process, none of them have had an election. And that's because that provision can be waived in order to facilitate compliance with the CVRA. Um, and so that would be something that we would recommend the district would, would request and we would expect the county committee would approve. It saves the district a lot of time and a lot of money, uh, to be honest, to, to be able to get that waived. So that would be the final sort of formal step the information would then be transmitted to the elections officials and they would uh, implement uh, the, the changes on their end. And, and really importantly, how this actually ends up rolling out is in the, the, there's no immediate impact from the transition. So it's not as if when the board adopts the maps then the next day we have an election for all board, five board members with the trustee areas. Instead, what happens is as trustee area, or excuse me, as trustee seats come up for election in 2022, and then in 2024, the seats that are up for election, those elections will be held by trustee area instead of at large. So the seats in 2022 will be held, uh, those seats that come up will be trustee area, and then between 22 and 24, it means you'll have a mix of board members, those elected at large in 2020 and those elected by trustee area in 2022. And that'll be the case until 2024 when those, uh, the, the, the members elected in 2020, those seats will come up in 24 and also be elected by trustee area at that time. And so after 24, uh, then all five board members will have been elected by trustee um, area and that process will continue obviously um, on that two year election cycle going forward. So that's sort of an, uh, an overview. I want to turn it over. I think um, Assistant Superintendent was going to talk a little bit about, you know, I, I kind of was talking about the phases in the abstract. I think he can talk about uh, how that pans out schedule wise and, and it's actually all on this slide. So you can kind of see how we're implementing it and all the opportunities for, for public input. Uh, thank you, William. So just uh, uh, to reiterate it, we've, uh, you know, um, have the requirements for the public hearings and we've interlaced that with additional community meetings um, that will uh, hopefully will we'll be able to take advantage of the better uh, situation with COVID and be in person. And so we're right now here, uh, we had our first community outreach. There'll be a very similar meeting that we will uh, have a, a next a week um, at the 18th for our, our first public meeting. And then the, um, the, the Thursday on December 9th will be another public hearing but in that one, we'll also be um, requesting the board to approve that mapping criteria that we'll discuss today and at the next board meeting. And then, and then we'll come back in January and start to provide information about draft uh, um, uh, boundary area um, uh, mapping options for the uh, election trustee by uh, area. And so we'll start out with a community workshop uh, at Fairlands. We'll then have a, a, a public hearing and then on the 15th of February, this is a special board meeting. So it, it really combines um, information and mapping communities to a kind of a larger community board meeting, but it's not one of the public hearings. It is an additional meeting that we're having. And then we go back to the public hearings and then uh, finally a community meeting. And then, and then we are marching towards uh, having the maps approved or having the map approved on the 24th so that we can then go into phase three. So again, uh, the information is on our website and we'll kind of um, go through that in a little bit, how you can access that, but there all will be virtual options. And then as uh, health requirements change, we hope to 
um, have more uh, in-person um, options as well uh, in the new year. So that's kind of like our uh, overall schedule. Um, we'll kind of do a little bit of a deep dive into the criteria and the uh, data, and then we will um, talk about how, how um, the community can access our website and provide um, uh, feedback to us. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over, David, back to you. All right, thank you, Ahmad. All right, now I'm gonna, I'm the demographer, um, and I'm gonna kind of walk you through a little bit of the process that I go through. This process starts essentially with me putting together some map scenarios that, as Ahmad mentioned, will probably be available to the public and the board right after the new year, at least some initial scenarios. Uh, and then we'll get more interactive with the community and the board members uh, as far as making some adjustments and additional maps. But uh, a couple examples here, this is just kind of very simplified versions of how you could draw lines of five different areas, different ways, depending on how uh, the district's uh, streets are set up or major freeways or whatnot could be uh, dividing points. But these are just some examples here. The most important thing I wanna show is that when I come up with these, whatever scenarios we start with or even end with, they all have to have equal total population. So if there's gonna be five areas, and I'll show you the numbers in a few moments, we know what the total uh, population is for the entire district area as of the most recently uh, released census data for 2020. And it's pretty simple math. You just divide it by five. That's your target number. But every area has to have equal population. This is not based on voters. It's literally from age zero to the elderly. Everyone in the district is counted. And for that's the, criteria, the main criteria we look at. And of course, we'll talk a little bit more about the complying with the Federal Voting Rights Act. And I'm gonna break down here on the next slide a little bit more detail what that means. So the things that, first of all, we can look at other underlying data behind the proposed boundaries, but such as uh, race, ethnicity, even voter, total voter estimates in each area. But those are not what I look at when I'm coming up with these boundaries. I told you just a moment ago, it's, it's focused on equal or more close within a certain variance, I'll talk about that in a moment, of a, a certain number, a target number for each of these areas, okay? We also wanna make sure that the areas are what we call compact. And you don't wanna see long east-west narrow boundaries or north-south stretching out over a long period. You wanna make areas that more or less are compact, like imagine a, a ball or a circle and fitting them into a circle. They're not gonna all be perfect because of the geography of the district, but that's what we want. We want them to be as compact as possible. We want them to be contiguous. So no separate areas. They're gonna be all connected to each other to make one unified district area of five areas. Um, and then we, as I mentioned before, we wanna use major roadways, highways, waterways, natural boundaries is a, at least a good starting point. And then we have to look at the numbers and see how they balance out. And also, and, and William could even address this a little bit more. This is where the, the lawyer checks everything, but community of interest. Um, this is where even your input from the board, from the public can look at things and say, we wanna keep these areas intact if possible. Together, they, they are like-minded and they have common interests. And this community keep this together as best we can. And everything is based on the best we can. So we move on to the next slide. Before you go there, so yes. I just want to make sure this is not this this is not what we want to do. Correct? <laughs> it's supposed to represent uh, no. gerrymandering, I believe, or correct, William? Yeah, yeah, that, that's the uh, for just we we'll put that up there. That's the where the original the origination of the term gerrymander. That's the district that started it all. Um, so yeah, so if you could put, you know, I, I got a joke, but if you could put uh, wings and eyes on it, it's probably not a good district. Yeah, I hope not that none of my areas look anything like that. So that's a good thing to point that out. Um, now this next part is more uh, for the board and for the public. These are 
what I'll call kind of suggestions. You can ask me as the demographer, please look at certain criteria that's important to you and I will do my best and I will go check each one of the things. This is just a, could be a small list of the criteria that you're asking the board at some point to approve. These are just some ones to suggest. You might wanna say, let's look all at our current elementary school boundaries, try to keep certain ones intact if possible. Or the opposite, let's try to, some might say, let's split them up so they're not all exactly the same, depending on what direction we're given. You could look at the actual locations of your elementary schools and try to have a, an equal number of those in each of the areas, if that's possible or look at your secondary schools, see how those are distributed. Um, those are other things. Um, respect uh, voters will, that's, you know, again, we we're tr we have to be careful not to skew, like when I'm drawing these boundaries a certain way, you know, we could know where, for example, certain board members live, but we are not supposed to be looking at that entirely when we're creating the boundaries. We could look, as I mentioned before, we could look at other, layers or other detailed information um, after the boundaries are drawn and that they are equal. And then we can look at, and then that, those other criteria can be the ones where the board decides and they might have three or five scenarios in front of them with the other underlying data that could help them decide, let's, let's go for this one and not these, for example. So we also potentially can look at uh, future plan growth, meaning, we do have to do our best to balance the areas. I mentioned there's a variance, an acceptable variance. We'll talk about that in a moment, but we can maybe know if a certain area or this part of the district is going to grow for sure in the next 10 years, then maybe we can leave that a little bit smaller. It's still an acceptable variance in the other areas. So we know there's gonna be more people, therefore more voters in a sense in that area, that can be slightly done as well, if that's um, something known. And again, there's other demographic characteristics, other criteria I could share that, that might help, you know, sway the board to decide which way to go on a, on a certain plan. So let me start sharing some of the data that I already have. Go to the next slide here. Like I said, I, I just to give you a little bit of background too. The, 2020 census was supposed to have all the information come out like last March or April. Because of COVID, things got delayed. So it really did not get released until around August, September. And it was closer to sometime in October before the state vetted the data and released it to CS demographers or other people to access. So I really haven't had more than maybe about a month access to this data. And since there's a certain time window, well, you know, we have a plan to get all this done the next three to four months or so. Um, we have, a, it came at the right time. And I'm just sharing this now for you to see for the first time. So the 2020 census says that your district boundaries you see there on the screen, there's a little over 81,000 residents or population in that area. And as I mentioned before, you just simply divide that number by five and you come up with that 16,203. That's kind of our target. When I start making these boundaries, that's what I'm aiming for. It can be a little bit above, a little bit below, but we're trying to get something in that neighborhood in each of these areas. And there's a total of 963 census blocks. And you see on the screen here, all those kind of outlined areas those are census blocks that they come up with every 10 years. Don't ask me exactly how they come up with some of these shapes. They look pretty silly, some of the shapes when I get in there, but they're based on density sometimes and other criteria. And these are, this is the lowest area of geography that we get to use. So I'm at the mercy of whatever the size and shape of these boundaries are. We know what the information behind them, the population counts, uh, the uh, racial breakdown, sometimes of voting age information as well. So that's the criteria. And that, as you see on the screen, that's the density of your existing population. So the darker areas are your more dense parts of your, your district. And, and so the lighter or the less dense. You see the scale there on the left. So the next slide, please. So I thought I'd also share a little bit of what's happened in the last 10 years 
in your within your boundaries. So I mentioned that 81,016, that's the total of the 2020. If you look back 10 years ago, it was almost exactly 10,000, but it's exact 10,000 less, but uh, 71,334, that equates to a growth of almost 9,700 people in your district boundaries between the two census over the last 10 years. And when you look at it broken down by the different uh, racial classes, you can see that what's very interesting is the Asian to white percentage population, the shift from 2010 to 2020. The other ones are not that far off from where they were percentage wise last time, but that's just an interesting uh, little note that I wanted to point out to everybody. The next slide, please. And deep, doing a little bit deeper dive um, in this screen on the left, the pit map is the breakdown of the Asian population. So you can see areas of higher concentration versus less. So we could do things like this. this don't forget, you have no individual five districts yet. So we're just looking at your district as a whole, but I'll be able to do similar maps or charts for each of your five areas, no matter what scenarios we come up with. So you'll be able to, be able to see how these break down as well. So this is what's called CVAP or Citizens Voting Age Population Estimates. And it's a, essentially, it, they don't, it's, an, it's over the last essentially four years or so, uh, average, if you will, of what an estimate of the counts of voters in each of these same um, geographic areas you're seeing here. So you can see the breakdown now of the actual total voters or estimates here in terms of the different racial classes as well. And roughly, you see at the bottom there, 64% of your overall population is of voting age. So I just thought I'd put that out there as well. So about a little over 52,000 as of the 2020 census estimates. And let's next slide. I think, uh, let's see, Wamad I think was gonna take up on this one. Yeah, so just to kind of uh, finish it off in terms of opportunities, uh, we have these are the community workshops we're going through the uh, that we have that are still before us. Um, and then we have the board meetings and then the community meeting um, we have um, interlaced as a community board meeting. So we have plenty of opportunities to talk about these uh, and through Zoom um, and hopefully in person soon. Uh, and we've also created opportunities for online information and input can be accessed from our district website. Um, and uh, I think uh, Patrick has put a quick link up there, but if you are looking for it, it and you go to our main website under departments, board of trustees by trustee area. And we've also created a, a, a tiny URL. If you uh, click on, I'll click on this and you'll see the website we have created. Uh, can you guys, can you see that, the website? Okay. And so a little bit of background information um, in a couple of paragraphs of, of, of what the process is. We have our, we'll put important documents uh, here. So the resolution and other documents, um, you can sign up to receive updates. And so if you're on this list, the, the next meeting will send you a notification that a meeting is coming up. Uh, we have created a, a community input form um, and as the maps become available, we'll modify it. Right now, it's a pretty general um, input form that asks for your name, your email, and you know what input you want to share. And if, and, um, if you're a parent, resident, um, so on and so forth. So some basic uh, information there. Uh, to the left, you'll see uh, the meeting and the, the all the links and uh, information will be available here. So the uh, material presented here will be uploaded as well as uh, the recorded version of this. So others at some other point can go back and look at it. And finally, once the mapping information is available, we'll post that uh, and we hope to be able to have uh, some level of interactivity and engagement uh, that the community can uh, do through, through, through our website and especially during those community meetings where we can have some of the maps available and, and, and even make some adjustments um, based on community um, input and engagement. So that's, our, that's gonna be our process. 
um, for this. Again, um, you know, we're excited uh, to start to kickstart this officially today. We'll have our first public uh, hearing meeting next week, and then we hope to be able to bring back uh, the first draft maps uh, to the community and the board in in January. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing the screen so we could um, everyone can see us. And um, I guess uh, Patrick, uh, we can see if there's any um, questions in the in in the box, and uh, um, if not, if there's anybody in in our attendees who would like to um, ask a question. All right, we don't have any uh, questions in the Q and A, but um, if if you would like to ask a question verbally, go ahead and raise your hand, and we will. Um, allow you to speak. All right, Mr. Mark Miller, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Go ahead. Oh. Um, so when we talk about the demographics um, and we talk about voting age, does that, what's the implication relative to actually registered voters? Sorry, I didn't hear that last part. So, so, so voting age could be one thing, but registered voters, not everybody who's of voting age can actually vote. So does that get taken into account? And to be honest with you, I, and maybe William can answer that. Yeah. This is data, you know, go ahead and just, William, you wanna answer that? Yeah, no, and, and it's, so it, it, it's part of the acronym, right? So CVAP, so it's, it's, um, it's citizen voting age population. So essentially it's it's not only the age component, but it's also eligibility. Um, so essentially what CVAP is telling you is um, the, the estimated population that's eligible to register to vote, whether or not they are or not. Um, we can take a look at, sometimes districts will wanna look at uh, registered voters in different areas just to see if that's another demographic that helps, but CVAP uh, or citizen voting age population, that's the number that courts say we're supposed to be looking at uh, for purposes of Federal Voting Rights Act and race and ethnicity consideration. So that's why CVAP is what was highlighted on that on that slide. So just to clarify, I think you're saying these are potential, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the question, so, you know, you'd have to be a citizen or 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 whatnot to be able to vote. So, I guess I'm still not clear as to what you would consider in that regard. You mean you mean what's the what's the data used for? Well, so if you're gonna if you're gonna base the areas on voting demographics, if that's one of the criteria, I know that's just one of the criteria. But if you're gonna base it on that, is it based on um, people who, because you could say potentially vote based on age, but but there's also legally allowed to vote, right? Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think that's kind of what the citizen part is shorthand for. Um, you know, you, you both would have to be eligible from citizenship okay. status as well as age. Um, and, and just to be clear that when we talk about the population balance, uh, David was talking about that we have to be sort of within that narrow variance that is that's total population the only time we're looking at the citizen voting age population number is where we're just checking to make sure we're in compliance uh with federal law and given um given the dem demographics of your district i don't think that's really going to become a consideration in this process we'll, we'll be working with david throughout to make sure that we don't there's nothing we need to look at there but i, I don't get the sense so far that it's going to be a consideration I do want to clarify too, as, as William said, remember, I don't use the voting age as when I'm creating them and I'm looking at the numbers, if you will. I'm not looking at so much as I am producing once I get the numbers to balance the total population, then I create additional outputs of information that I share with William. He looks at the maps, looks at the numbers, looks at the other underlying data, and before they become true scenarios that were released to the public or the board, I have to vet it through his eyes and make sure, as he mentioned, that there's, it kind of checks all the boxes to him. Um, so I don't really, again, I'm not looking at 
the voting age when I'm doing this. So I just want to be clear on that. If the, the, it is what it is, let's say when I'm done, and then he might look at that and say, no, this doesn't look right, as try something else. But, or he might say, you know, again, in his case, the numbers are the numbers. So I just want to make it clear, I don't look at the voting age information when I'm creating the boundaries. It's more once I have a good scenario where everything balances and it looks acceptable to me, I put those outputs out, he looks at it, and then it becomes a viable scenario. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Patrick, do you want to see if there's any other questions from our uh, from our attendees? I just saw a hand go up, but I think it disappeared. So don't be shy. I saw it go up again. Did you catch who it was? Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Um, PUSD user. That would be me, Patrick. <laughs> hey, Steve. How are you? Can I follow up with what Trustee Miller was, I think, alluding to is that as you divide up into the areas, because we're trying to make this where everyone has a voice, what if the one area that, as we divide it, uh, is a large demographics that is not eligible to vote, therefore a smaller majority of that particular area maybe have the voting power? Is there any way to look at that and try to maneuver that? I know you can't go out and register people to vote, but if we're truly trying to be representative of all um, people in our district, it could be one area has a large um, community, but they're not uh, eligible to vote or most of them are not, then they would not really have a voice. Well, I guess what I would say is I think that that's another one of the things that, um, you know, uh, David was talking about communities of interest. So communities of interest can be a lot of things. Um, sometimes, you know, with school districts, we talk about attendance boundaries. It could be, you know, sometimes it's formal neighborhoods. It might be uh, communities that were built together. It might be places that all, you know, all the kids in that neighborhood play soccer at one day, you know, all kinds of different things. But something else we can look at is sort of, you know, again, that is a place where we can look at um, race and ethnicity data as far as is there a community of folks, even if it's not showing up in some other data. Um, as, as David was said, that can be one factor. We can't, um, we can't necessarily uh, use race in a way that violates federal law, but we can consider it in that, in that um, circumstance. So if the board is aware or wants that kind of information, that's something um, we can talk about. And I think we can provide that demographic information from the maps and maybe that's a reason why the board says you know we like map one better than map two because we think it keeps that community together better than map two does um so that that's the kind of stuff that i think when we get to the maps it'll be easier to see that if i could jump in just for a second i want to make sure that um we you understand everyone understands that there is a, a venue for um the board to be able to address questions in the public hearings and so let's let's go ahead and save some of those questions for when everybody gets to um, a board meeting. Great, um, thank you. So Patrick, uh, any final questions from our panelists uh, and attendees? Um, if not, I think we could uh, conclude this meeting. Um, you know, we kind of gave it a couple of hours open, but I was hoping that it would be within that hour. And, and I think that these first initial meetings will be. And then once we get, obviously, the, the maps will be much more interactive and, and, and we'll, we'll go to make sure we cover um, everyone's uh, questions and, um, and input at that time. So, so before, you, before you move on, would you, there is one question from, um, a parent in the Q&A, can you? Oh, great. Um, I'll go ahead and read that. We're discussing using neighborhood school attendance boundaries in determining trustee areas. PUSD allows open enrollment in which students from neighborhoods from outside the boundaries to attend. Would that data be used in determining trustee boundaries? Um, so uh, 
David, do you want to take that one? Because these are the, the school boundaries and the uh, election boundaries are kind of separate. Yeah, I, let me let me start, David, and then you, because you have a good name, you can go right after me. Um, I just want to say that we, we have to be careful to keep the two issues separate um, because they play into different things in the community. And so in this particular case, it really is about um, voter, voter rights and ensuring that everybody has a voice. And the school boundaries area will be about balancing um, enrollment. And so there really aren't the same thing. So David, you can give me a, a letter grade on my response and then fill in the gaps. No, it's fine. And like, uh, and William knows as well, we deal with lots of other school districts that have gone through this. And I, I gave that list on that one slide as suggestions. Um, the board is going to come up with their own criteria. So they'll, I just put it out there because as William will attest, um, we've heard lots of probably crazy ideas sometimes, some we can't do, some we can, but one of them is, you know, they look, you look at it, think of it as a, a sometimes a school attendance area, uh, elementary school is a community. So the idea of, again, keeping certain communities together, but I, as you saw in my notes, we said it could be the opposite. You purposely want to divide them. That was more of a suggestion. If the board does not feel comfortable about uh, looking at any of your existing attendance areas, then that's not a criteria. It was only a suggestion. So I, I want that person to ask that question to know that's not what I'm using. It's just that one slide. If you go back to it, those were just potential suggestions that the board can come to me as a demographer and William as a suggestion. It doesn't have to happen and more than likely they will not be the, the boundaries, but some districts want to overlay by their boundaries, elementary, middle, or high school boundaries, and see how they they fit among the, the proposed districts. So that can be just something just for curiosity's sake to know. Right. And, and I think one, one other thing that I wanted to point out, and I should have done it probably at the beginning of this uh, meeting, is that you know our process is, is about the school district and is separate from uh, the city's process, which they'll be uh, kind of starting their engagement in January. And so they're also um, going through um, a similar process for their uh, council member um, elections and that they have four council members and a mayor. And so they'll be having four districts uh, within the city. Our school district boundaries are different. They in are very similar, but they also include portions of unincorporated um, Alameda County as well. And so ours are going to be for the school district. There'll be five bound, uh, five areas within our school district and is separate from uh, the process the city has. Just a clarification. Um, and we'll, we'll probably start to reiterate that more and more as their process also um, starts later um, in January. So any final questions or um, uh, information anyone wants to share? Great. So I guess this will conclude it. We'll have this uh, hopefully up in the next few days on our website and for those who missed the exciting action tonight. Good night, everyone.